So I realized that why I couldn't remember the, the family because I actually was saying it wrong. So I'm going to correct that. Um, so we belong to the class mammalia, mammalia, but we belong to the order primates. See? See how I made that mistake earlier? Yeah. Um, and we belong to the family hominini, the genus Homo, and the species sapiens, Homo sapiens. So sorry about that. All right. So moving on. Um, the, here's the thing. You know, Linnaeus, he was great. He figured out how to classify organisms. Uh, he did it down to the species level, all of this other cool stuff. But the truth is that, um, that species are really not that easy to define as I've made it out to be. So let me talk to you about what the problems are. Like, for example, in the biological species concept, it was always based on who could have sex with who. And it turns out that there's lots of asexual species out there. So if you've got an asexual species, how do you know if it belongs to the same species or to a different species, if it's the same type or a different type from something else, if neither one of them are having sex? It doesn't make any sense. It's a, it's a way that the biological species concept doesn't work. Also, if you think about it, what do you do with all those fossils laying around? I mean, really, they're all kinds of dinosaur bones, and how do you know that this dinosaur bone was a different species from this other dinosaur bone? Because you can't see them having sex. Um, so that makes a problem for saying whether or not this thing's a triceratops or that thing is, a, you know, a what, whatever, Velociraptor. Um, so another issue is also has to do with timing because, of course, things evolve, and as they evolve, they change. So as things are slowly changing over time, when do you decide that this one is different enough from this one back here? I mean, there's so much time has gone by that there's no way that this it could even be having sex with that one. So the biological species concept doesn't really apply to this situation. There's also this thing called a ring species, and ring species are a little bit challenging to understand. Make sure you read up on this in your textbook. But basically what a ring species is, is um, a group of organisms that live kind of around the edge of something. Like maybe this is a mountain range, or maybe it's a, a large lake or something like that. And the species kind of live all the way around the edges of it. Well, um, species tend to originate in one place and, you know, move around, spread out, expand slowly over the course of maybe thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, and, they, and they might end up going all the way around the edge of that barrier or structure. So we've actually been able to describe many ring species and here's the, the unique thing about ring species is that when the two species or the when, sorry when the two ends of this ring come together it turns out that they can't mate with each other but here's the trick within the ring as you're going along the ring these can all kind of all these different populations here they can all mate with each other they can all mate with their neighbors so we would think that they were the same species but when you get to the ends of the ring these two groups, these two populations can't meet with each other. So are they biological species or are they not biological species? It gets really confusing. Finally, there are some species that can hybridize and hybridize quite readily, but don't usually do it. And so are those two things the same species because they can make hybrids? Or are they different species because they don't usually mate and have babies? I mean, it's just confusing, and it is what it is. Uh, so but biologists have come up with other species concepts to help them, because the biological species concept can be very confusing. So there's all these shortcomings, and so one possible approach is to define a species based on what it looks like, and that's what the morphological species concept does. It describes species based on what they look like. That's what morphology is. You'll see this word a couple times in the chapter. Morphology is not the study of change, just so you know. Like you think about morphing, mighty morphing Power Rangers or something, I don't know. Morph 
in this usage means just the way something looks. Uh, to morph means to change, but amorph is the way something looks. And so the morphological species concept characterizes groups or species based on physical features that they have, like body size and shape and whether or not they have feathers and, you know, things along those lines. Um, this is an extremely useful tool for classifying asexual species. It's a very useful tool for classifying fossil species. It's a very useful tool for classifying species that changing over time. It's even a useful tool for uh, ring species, species and hybrid species, hybridizing species. So very, very useful tool. However, it is not the best definition to understand evolution, which is why we spend so much time trying to understand the biological species concept. Flawed as it is, it really gives us a nice framework for understanding evolution. The morphological species concept is actually the most used definition. Like if you're discovering a new species, you're going to use the morphological species concept to, to figure that out. You're not going to use the biological species concept. But if you're trying to figure out how those things evolved in the first place, you will definitely be using the biological species concept. Hopefully that makes sense. But you know, even there are even some flaws with the morphological species concept. There's a whole bunch of different species concepts out there. I'm going to share one more with you just for fun. And that's the ecological species concept. What the ecological species concept says is that um, a set of organisms, they, they adapt to a specific set of resources um, that's called the niche or niche, depending on how you like to pronounce things. So um, if these organisms adapt to this niche, then what you have are these like discrete clusters of populations that we can recognize as species because the ecology of these species is actually controlling the evolution of that species. Um, it's figuring out how resources are divided and, and these, these kind of ways that resources are divided end up producing these clusters that we call species. See, biologists can be very confusing and use very, very crazy definitions, but you know what it turns out? If you start to study biology more, I know, I know you're not gonna, but, but that's okay. But if you decided to, that this would be one of those species concepts that you would explore a little bit further. So now we have all these species concepts, um, mostly focusing on the biological species concept, right? How do new species even arise? And just definition for you here, uh, the process by which one species splits into two distinct species, that process is called speciation. So there's two really important phases that must happen for any speciation to occur. You've got to have reproductive isolation, which we have already discussed, and you have to have genetic divergence, which is just accumulating all these genetic mutations over time. So there's two ways that this could happen, right? You've got to have both reproductive isolation and genetic divergence, and you could do them in one order or the other. So the first order is where we have reproductive isolation first and followed by genetic divergence, and that's called allopatric speciation, literally different patches, allopatric. On the other hand, you can have sympatric speciation. That means same patches or same location. And with sympatric speciation, you actually get genetic divergence happening first followed by, uh, rather quickly, by reproductive isolation. So let's take a look at allopatric speciation. Keep in mind we've got to have reproductive isolation and genetic divergence. Let's see how allopatric speciation works. So imagine that you've got a population of ground squirrels, and they're all the same ground squirrel, they all live in the same place, but they you know, through no fault of their own, become reproductively isolated by a barrier. This barrier is a geographic barrier. It's a river. And, um, and that river is like slowly eating away at the landscape you can see. But because of this river, these two populations can no longer breed with each other. So they're reproductively isolated. 
Then comes the genetic divergence. This one maybe ha gets a mutation that leads it to be more blue in the case of the cartoon, or this one's a little more green in our cartoon. And that's because they're not mating with each other, so they get to have their own mutations. And this is exactly the kind of thing that happened with the, the ground squirrels on the north and the south rim of the Grand Canyon. The Harris's ground, antelope ground squirrel and the white-tailed antelope ground squirrel on, are on opposite sides of the Grand Canyon. They look very, very similar to each other, but if you were to put these two together in the same place, they would not be mating and having viable babies. Allopatric speciation. We see this kind of allopatric speciation a lot in nature. For example, um, we've got the finches of the Galapagos Islands. So there's a, Galapagos Islands are just a series of islands off the coast of Ecuador. If you will recall in chapter 8, I talked to you about how Darwin spent some time in the Galapagos. It's actually a very formative experience for him. But when he visited these islands, he noticed that there were 14 different species um, on these islands. And a lot of them were like the only species of finch on those islands. For example, we have the, like the woodpecker finch uh, on this island. This woodpecker finch acts just like a woodpecker. There are no other woodpeckers on these islands. And so what we've got is this really cool little woodpecker finch that is taking advantage of all of the all of the um the insects that live below the surface of that trunk of a tree uh, we have the large ground finch that lives on this island and you can see that how big that beak is this is compared to the small tree finch with a very very small beak they eat very different types of seeds the large cactus finch eats uh flowers basically and we have the very, very cool and extremely unique vampire finch. Yes, there is a finch that drinks the blood of other animals. The vampire finch found only on Santiago Island in the Galapagos Islands. So this is that idea of you've got reproductive barriers, in this case, the Pacific Ocean, allowing for the these animals to speciate on these different islands uh, that's kind of cool especially the vampire finch so you can have speciation without geographic isolation first and that's our sympatric speciation um, the main way that we've been documenting sympatric speciation is with a very major mutation called polyploidy polyploidy is what happens when you have more than one set of chromosomes in a cell. So um, you've heard you've heard diploid, right? Diploid is when when you're normally two n. That was that math that I taught you before a few chapters ago. So that's diploid, um, but polyploid can be like having three sets or four sets or eight sets of chromosomes instead of the normal two sets, one from mom and one from dad. You're getting extra sets. And um, and that is not isolation first followed by genetic divergence. It is itself a genetic divergence. It is huge, <laughs> and it's a it's huge. It's a genetic issue, and it is the fastest way that you can get a new species by going through this process of sympatric speciation. So let's take a look at two ways that your book goes through. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Your book goes into a lot of details. Meh. Here's what I want you to get out of it. Um, there's always a, the problem here with polyploidy is always a problem with cell division. And there's a couple of ways that the problem with cell division can happen. First of all, you could have a cell division problem in meiosis where you're forming the gamete but you form the gamete wrong, like you don't go through the actual cytokinesis process. And so if a polyploid gamete, that one that did not go through cytokinesis, is fertilized by a normal gamete, you actually get a 3N offspring. And it is possible that this, this or organism can survive just fine. Oftentimes, 
though those are sterile. And if they're sterile, it's kind of an evolutionary dead end. However, you can have what happens is poly two polypoid gametes that are exactly the same, they could fertilize each other. And if that happens, then you can get a perfectly viable individual. So again, the main problem here was right back here where we had cell division um, issues, right? It didn't, it didn't go through my, meiosis cytokinesis. The other way that this could happen is if you have normal cell division in meiosis, but you've got two different species gametes coming together, and when that happens, you just don't have homologous chromosomes. And if you don't have homologous chromosomes, you're kind of a dead end. However, if you introduce a cell division error and you um, fail to separate those uh, sister chromatids, then you can start to go through and have have a, a new species form. So that's what I want you to know. Like all those details, they're interesting, but mostly polyploidy happens when you have a, a division, a cell division error. There's also another kind of sympatric speciation that I want you to know about, but your book doesn't bring it up, but I think it's really interesting, and that is it's, it's a different kind of, of genetic divergence that leads to uh, genetic isolation and reproductive isolation. And so, um, and this is an interesting one, so I'm going to go through and talk to you about the details. So what we have here is a fruit fly. And, um, and this fruit fly is called Ragolatus pominella. By the way, notice that I'm following the rules of how to use this uh, species name genus, species, and so forth. So this is a very special fruit fly because it, um, it is known to lay its eggs on uh, hawthorn fruits. And if you've never seen a hawthorn fruit, this is a hawthorn fruit. Um, hawthorns are known for their very long thorns, and these fruits are very, very small. They're not really super edible or anything, but fruit flies must lay their eggs in fruit. And so um, I'm going to talk about any fruit fly that lays its eggs on the hawthorn fruit. I'm just going to call it the haw fly, just because I need to somehow distinguish that from the other fruit fly that I'm going to be talking about, which is also called Ragolatus pominella. Um, but it lays its eggs on apple trees. And here's the thing that we know. Um, apple trees have not always been in North America. They're actually introduced from Europe and Asia. And so this gives us a timeline for uh, the native haw fly that lay, laid its eggs on the native uh, American fruits, right? We, we start to have a timeline for when we start to see uh, f these flies laying on their eggs on the hawthorn fruits versus laying on the apple fruits. And so I'm going to call these ones, even though they're considered the same species right now, I'm going to call these haw flies if they lay uh, their eggs on hawthorn fruits, and I'm going to call them apple flies if they lay them on apples. All right, so why am I calling this an example of sympatric speciation? And that's all related to how um, what's happening with these haw flies and with these apple flies. So here's the thing about the haw flies. They, uh, the adults, they only live for a very short period of time, just a couple of weeks. And they, uh, they emerge from the ground where they've spent the last year, pretty much. And they emerge and they fly up from, and they, they mate and they lay their eggs on the hawthorn fruits right when they're about to ripen, which is in the late summer. Now, after they lay their eggs, after they mate, they lay their eggs and then they die. The, uh, the eggs eat the hawthorn fruits. The hawthorn fruits fall to the ground. The larvae then dig into the ground and they, I'm using the word hibernate, that's not quite what's going on there, but it's close enough, um, until the next summer. However, a mutation occurred in the haw flies. We're not sure when, but it was around 200 years ago, uh, and that led to the ancestors that we're calling the apple flies. The apple flies 
had a mutation that caused them to emerge earlier in the summer when there is no hawthorn fruits around. And so they flew around trying to find a place to lay their eggs and they came across these apples. Um, apples are, start to ripen earlier in the summer compared to hawthorn fruits. And so they laid their eggs and they made it and they laid the eggs and then they died and the apple fruits fall to the ground. And, and what we got here is a whole huge subset of these flies called the apple flies that are emerging from the ground earlier. Now, they're emerging from the ground earlier. They only live for a couple weeks. They're not mating with the haw flies. So we think that what we're seeing here is a real life sympatric speciation happening kind of right before our eyes. And we're still working on it, but we've given um, the haw flies and the apple flies different subspecies names. Maybe we'll eventually give them their own species names. I think that's kind of cool. Okay, so we're, we're um, moving on to the next section in your book where we're categorizing living th things based on their evolutionary relationships. And uh, I have a few terms here for you. So the first term is systematics. And systematics is simply the way we name species, the way we arrange species relative to other species based on um, what, how they share a common ancestor and the points in history in which they diverged from that common ancestor. Um, phylogeny is another important word and phylogeny is just a fancy word for saying evolutionary history. Now, eventually we're going to be looking at these graphs that we'll call phylogenies because they they depict the evolutionary history. And when we look at those, just on the next slide, coming up soon, we'll be looking at these things called, these structures called nodes. Um, nodes indicate common ancestor points on these phylogenies. And then finally, the term divergence comes into place. No, I'm not talking about the novel. I'm talking about um, a type of evolution called divergent evolution. And divergent evolution or divergence is simply describing the evolution that occurs from that common ancestor moving forward in time to the descendants and it also describes how those uh, organisms those groups accumulate differences over time so that's that's what divergence means all right this is your very first phylogeny um, this is our evolutionary tree and it describes how uh, how these organisms drawn here at the top are related to each other. Remember, phylogeny is our evolutionary histories, and we draw these evolutionary histories like a tree. So there's a diff lots of different ways we can start looking at these, but let's just name them. We've got the fish, the bird, the human, the rat, and the mouse. And if we start thinking about the rat and the mouse, um, you can kind of understand that they have their rodents, right? And they had a common ancestor back in time. Notice that this is a graph, so there's an axis right there of time. There's actually a second axis we'll be doing in lab. It's this axis right here. That's the axis of divergence. So based on this, um, this, by the way, is called the node. That's the place of divergence. And is also indicating the common ancestor of the rats and the mice. Um, so if we look back a little bit further in time, we see this node right here. And the organisms that branch off of this node are the set that is the rats and mice. Those are the, the, the um, yeah, the rodents. And then we have this branch that leads over here towards the human. That, that ancestor right there at that node um, was neither human nor rat nor mouse. It was the common ancestor to humans, rats, and mice had a lot of things in common. For example, if you think about all three of these organisms, they've got four limbs, they've got fur, they feed their young with milk, right? All of these things, were those, those characteristics were in the common ancestor of the mice, rats, and humans. Going a little bit further back in time, we see this node, and this node is the common ancestor of uh, birds and the set humans, rats, and mice. And if you think about it, birds, humans, rats, and mice do have things in common, 
right? They have four limbs, although birds, maybe you don't think about their wings as limbs, but they are. Um, they are warm-blooded. They have, they have hemoglobin. They have eyes. You know, they have all these things in common. Uh, so, so the common ancestor of them didn't, didn't feed its young milk, but it did have four limbs had two eyes on its head, it's got a fairly well-developed brain, that kind of thing. Going further back in time, we have the common ancestor of fish and the group of birds, humans, rats, and mice. What did these organisms all have in common? Well, they had spinal cords, right? They all have spinal cords. I mean, they don't really have limbs like that per se, right? They, they, because these have fins. Um, what else do they have in common? You know, it's starting to be a little bit less and a little bit less, but they definitely have some things in common, like they all have eukaryotic cells that are animal cells, right? Um, they have brains, they have hearts, things along those lines. So maybe you could try to picture what that common ancestor looked like. It was not a modern day fish, although it probably looked like a fish. It probably had fish-like structure to it. So at this point right here, where the node is, where the common ancestor is, you start to see these branches coming off this way and this way. And you saw that all along, but I wanted to point it out here, that what these lines are saying that are branching off from the node, what that's saying is that, that the species that was the common ancestor split into two lineages. One lineage that led to all the modern fish, and one lineage that led to birds and then led to the node that led to humans, rats and mice, and the node that led to rats and mice. So that's how we read this. Over here on this side, uh, I want you to pay attention that that those nodes, they're kind of arbitrary. Like we've got humans in the middle over here. But on this one, humans are over on the right hand side. And what I want to tell you is that this phylogeny and this phylogeny mean exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing. And so um, it's important for you to realize that this node is the common ancestor that led to humans and the group rats and mice. That's exactly what I said over here. This node is the common ancestor that led to humans and rats and mice. So even though they look a little bit different, they mean exactly the same thing. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop this now, and we'll finish this up with part three. See you in a little bit.